the reason that we're using a live event rather than a standard Teams meeting uh, is because we do have more than 1,000 registrations for the event. So Teams does have a limit where we can only have up to 1,000. So we had to switch to a live event rather than a Teams meeting. A lot of times we do like to try to use meetings when we don't exceed the limit because we can have questions over voice and people can come off of unmute. But in the event for a live event, what we're going to do is we're going to take questions throughout the, uh, the session and we have about 20 engineers from our team that will be monitoring the questions in the chat. So if you do have questions as we are demoing any of these right click options, please feel free to use that uh, Q&A feature of the live event. And just a quick overview, these are some screenshots of how it should look. You should have a little question, uh, question mark icon where you can go and ask questions. And then the engineers on our team will be monitoring that and answering it directly within the Q&A feature. We'll also be publishing a lot of those questions if they're applicable for the event in general so that other people can see questions throughout the event as well. Go and just an example of what that would look like. So to start things off, uh, we did ask some pre-screening questions. So it was pretty interesting to see some of the responses that we got uh, from attendees. So uh, quite a few of the customers that submitted those pre-questions, they actually had some comments around like, oh, I've never, I've never even known that right-click options to customize the way these apps and updates are installed were even available. We also had some uh, customers that make uh, use of the right-click features quite often and had some really great feedback for either new right click features that we could potentially add to our product or ways that we could improve the existing options. So for a little bit of history about how we created these before we jump right into the demo. So the first right click feature that we had based on customer feedback was we had customers that wanted to be able to add custom pre or post scripts to application deployments and update deployments. So what we did is in our publisher, which would be running on the server side, we created a feature for each product where you could right click, let's say Google Chrome, for example, and you could add custom pre or post scripts to do different type of actions that are specific to your company. So you could do things like run a PowerShell script that sets a home page. So on the client side, just because it initially started as the option to uh, execute custom pre and post scripts, the client side components of right clicks that you do that would affect the way that an app or update is applied is actually executed by a standalone executable called patch my PC script runner. And we actually have a log file on the client, which we'll be digging into throughout this demo that shows how those actions take place and how they correspond to the right click features that you enable on the server side. Uh, we have also improved and not all of the right click options are specific to client side actions such as running scripts or disabling shortcuts or disabling self updaters. We actually now have some that can apply and apply actions to server side components. So for example, we have a right click feature for Intune where you can add applications to enrollment status pages, for example. So there's it's not just the client side thing anymore. We can also do a lot of cool configurations that modify things, whether it's through the apps or the updates that aren't necessarily client side applicable. We can just jump to the next slide here and we have the demo. So what I'll do next, let me jump over to our demo lab. There we go. So to get started, we'll just kind of walk through what does it look like to uh, right click and apply different options? What are the different contexts that we can apply them to? Um, so first thing to get started, we'll take a look at our tabs that are applicable to updates. So the updates will be where you can publish a software update to the config manager updates node. So for example, any actions that we apply to this tab will apply to the software updates. We also do have the config man apps tab. So if we were to make any right click changes over in the config man apps, this would be for a base application. If we did in the updates, these would be for third party updates that would only be applied if a device already had an outdated third party application. So there's different tabs that we have and depending on where you're applying these right click features, 
you're going to actually get different options that are relevant to these different tabs. Uh, a quick note that I will call out while we're starting is if you right click anywhere on the uh, all products level, we do have a knowledge base article that does actually cover some of the right click options as well. Obviously, we'll be running through this through the demo, but if you just want to see all of the right click options that could be applied anywhere, whether it's an update, whether it's an application, whether it's an Intune app or an Intune update, we do have this all documented pretty well where uh, you can see details about, you know, where does this right click product apply to? Is it something I could apply to all the products? Can I only apply it at the individual product level? And whether it's applicable to applications and software updates or whether it's only applicable to like an application, for example. So to get started, let's go ahead and apply a couple of right click options to the updates tab. So when we right click on the all products level, there are going to be some options that are specific to anything and it can be ap applied recursively. So let's say for example, within your organization, you wanted to turn off the self updates feature. This is something that is very broad and could be applied to every single product that supports turning off self updates. So this would be an option that could be applied globally and it would recursively apply throughout the product tree to any product that supports these actions at the all products level. We do also have right click options that can be applied per vendor. So let's go down to Google Chrome, for example. And this was actually a question that we got in some of the screening questions about, well, you know, I don't want to go apply the same option to each individual product, and that's where the global options could really save you some time. Now at the product level, let's say that you wanted to have some settings that are applicable to every single Google Chrome product. We could right click the product level and we could apply these options that are global that could be applied and applicable throughout the, you know, throughout every product. We can apply those at the product level as well. And then lastly, we can apply right click options at the individual product level. So for example, when we compare the, uh, the vendor level or the all products level to the individual product, we actually have three additional options that show up because these changes would be relevant for a specific product. And you know, for example, if you were adding a custom pre or post script, or modifying the command line or adding a transform, it's very likely that these would only apply to a very specific product. Like you would only want to add a custom command line in most cases to only Google Chrome, for example. You wouldn't want to apply that at the all products level because it's likely something unique to that product. So that's the first thing to call out when we're reviewing how we can make customizations to the way that either an update gets applied or the way that an application gets applied. So that's step one is understanding there are going to be different levels that these can be applied to. And then before we actually start going into them individually, the second thing is there's going to be different options available for applications versus updates. So for example, if we right click at the all products level on the config manager apps tab, we can actually see that there are some additional options. For example, adding things like categories, security scopes, user experience, uh, process conflicts, things like that that are not applicable to updates, but they are applicable to applications. So for example, if we were to right click, and this might not necessarily be a great example because you probably wouldn't assign a custom category within the configuration manager console to every single application, but maybe you would. So for example, maybe there's an admin category. So if we go in and look at our applications in Config Manager, you do have the ability when you go and create an app to add custom categories. So let's just say hypothetically, you know, you wanted to add a backend admin category for something called Patch My PC Applications. So this would allow you to quickly go through and see which applications in your console were created by Patch My PC. So that's just the, the thing that I wanted to call out here is 
there are going to be different right click options available. So for example, if we jump over to Intune apps, we can see that there's a manage assignments feature and there's also a enrollment status page feature. So depending on where you are, you are going to get different options. So what we'll do now, we'll actually go through and, and walk through some of these as well. Uh, so Adam, do you want to talk about the manage installation logging? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is a great one to set straight away, probably at the old products level. Um, it's an opportunity for you to choose a path on your devices where you want verbose install logs to be saved. And the checkbox there for enable verbose logging for MSI installations, that passes the verbose parameter to um, MSI exec. Um, so, you know, this can be really helpful for um, failures too. So if you ever uh, experience failed installs, like this can be a really good resource. Um, I don't know if I should mention the last checkbox there about the central location for the, yeah, some customers use this. This is, um, some customers put a shared folder here um, and they collect all failed install logs generated by directly by the exe or the msi to a central location so that you know they can easily grab them for support or do kind of some fancy custom graphing with it yeah so I, this one's available across all tabs and i think this is the first one that all customers should do right out the gate personally yeah and i think that's a good point to call out adam is uh we can enable verbose logging if it's an msi but one thing to note, this is not just applicable for MSI based installers. This can also apply to EXE based installers. So we're able to do all the back end work to understand, you know, for say Notepad++ or other EXE based products, if they support logging, we'll go add all these switches for you in the background to save it here. So that's one we'll apply at the all products. Uh, disabling self updater. So Jake, do you want to talk about this one here? Uh, yeah, uh, this one's pretty self-explanatory for the most part. Um, some applications, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, good old apps like Google Chrome and several others have a self-updater built into them. And for the ones that do allow you to disable that during the installation, we can pass in the command line to do so. You'll notice Justin has up on his screen that currently there are 145 products in the catalog that support this option and the full list can be found down below. Awesome. Uh, another quick one would be the ability to delete public desktop icons. So in the event that you don't want to have a shortcut get created when an application or an update is installed or applied on the public desktop, meaning that if the user was a non-admin, they would not have the access to delete that. So things like, say, Google Chrome or some products that may put a public icon on the desktop, we can simply disable that and we'll automatically delete that shortcut post installation if it's an app or post update if it's an update and that shortcut appears on the all users desktop. Uh, the only other thing that we'll talk about, actually there might be a couple more, but we're gonna leave the manage conflicting processes for a individual product. But when you're applying uh, the right clicks to the updates, we do have the ability to either publish the updates with full content or metadata only. So what that means is if you use full content for any product that you've checked and enabled, it will actually download the binary, the full binary from the vendor. So in the case of Google Chrome, for example, it would go out to Google and it would download about a 70 meg MSI installer. Now, in the event that maybe you're first setting this up, you can also set it to metadata. So what that will do is it will only publish the applicability about the update and you can still see it in Configuration Manager, the compliance data, but it wouldn't actually download the content. So you wouldn't be able to actually deploy that update, but you would be able to get the scan results and then you could potentially determine if you did this for all products, you could then come back in and turn on full content for maybe the ones that you want. Now, we do also have a feature that uh, kind of can replace that where you don't have to publish everything to kind of get the stats, you can use our scan tool and this will actually evaluate the hardware inventory in your environment. So this is actually a way that many people will enable products that are already out there without having to go through and turn on metadata and kind of guess and then come back in. 
this can kind of replace that in a lot of situations. The other two, or the other, the other one that we'll look at, and this was actually part of the questions that we got ahead of time, is it would be cool if there's a right-click option that would show things like command line switches and, and items like that. If you actually right-click on all products, you can click show package info. And what this will actually do is it will show you all the details about all the products in the catalog. You could also do this action at the individual vendor lev level or product as well. So if we were to right click on Google and you wanted to get details about the products for Google as a vendor within the catalog, you can get those details. And this would also include some details such as command line. So when we go through and either create an update or an app for Chrome, uh, how would we install that silently? So everything that we do, whether it's an app install or a software update, we would always use a silent installation command line, and we would always use the command lines from the vendor if they support it to suppress reboots. You can also see things like download URL. So where are we getting the binary? And then lastly, we do also have the hash or the digest of the actual binary that's being used for that specific product. These are also clickable. So in the event that you click that, you will also go out the virus total and you can see the uh, virus total scan results for that specific binary as well. This is also part of our security where let's say that a vendor had a file that was tampered with. If the file hash does not match the hash that we use when we created the catalog that we use through virus total, it would not publish to your environment. So this can just be a pretty, pretty helpful way to go get a lot of the metadata about our catalog um, to see those details. So what we're gonna do for our software updates is we're going to go down to Notepad++. And I'm gonna show you one of the options that we can set at the individual uh, product level is where this generally makes the most sense. So I'm gonna click on the manage conflicting processes. And one thing that I will call out here is there is a documentation link on the more the manage conflicting processes that can be quite helpful. And the reason it can be helpful is this is not an option that you would want to likely enable on a lot of products. You would only want to enable this on products where it's actually needed. And what we have in this knowledge based article is we have a list of products that we know if the end user that is actually on the device where the update is being applied has that specific application open, it will not successfully update and it will fail. In some worst case scenarios, uh, such as Notepad++ and potentially Java, depending on what files are in use, it can actually do things that can corrupt the installation, which is a worst case. So for example, for Notepad++, we know that if the user has that app open and an update tries to apply, there's actually scenarios where things like DLLs can be overwritten and, and deleted, but it actually updates the registry so it looks like it was up to date, but it can actually leave you with a non-functioning app if the user had it open and their installer didn't handle that conflict well. So this is really the use case where the managed conflicting processes can make the most sense. So by default, if you did not apply any option, if the user had any application open like notepad plus.exe and an update was being applied, it would simply try to attempt the update. Now, most products will successfully do this. So for example, Google Chrome's a great example. Their MSI will actually stage things in the background and it will update it. And then it will simply monitor for when Chrome is closed and then it will apply and copy the actual file that couldn't be copied while it was in use, right? So it will successfully apply, but the user, if they had it open, they simply wouldn't get the latest uh, Chrome until the next time it launches, right? Now there might be situations for things like zero days where maybe that's not quick enough. So there could be a use case where even if an application say was in use and the installer could handle that, maybe you would wanna prompt the user to close or close automatically because maybe there was a critical security update and you, you deem that okay to interact with the user because you really wanted to make sure even if they have it open, I don't wanna wait until it closes the next time 
before Chrome gets updated because it's an important security update. So there, there's different use cases. One's going to be that where it gets corrupted. You obviously don't want that to happen. Or maybe there's a security update. That's kind of the two use cases where this could be helpful. So we have a couple different options here. So we can say, if Notepad is running, I'm going to just automatically close it and not notify the user at all. So it will just terminate the process and apply the update. Now, obviously, that's pretty invasive. You, most companies might not be comfortable with doing that because maybe the user didn't have time to close and save their work. Uh, so this is one option, but we find this to be used a little bit less often than others. We do also have an option where if it's open, we can automatically skip the update and it will apply, it will attempt to apply again during the next software update deployment and evaluation cycle. And then lastly, one of the features that we introduced probably within the last year is we can now interactively notify the user that they have an application open that we're attempting to update uh, and they need to either close it or they could snooze it depending on the options that you configure. So what we're gonna choose is we're gonna allow the pop-up to last as long as the maximum runtime within Configuration Manager for the software update. So this is 60 minutes by default. The reason that we can't extend beyond the max runtime is it will hold up any, any updates that would be applying after this gets shown and popped up to the user. And if it extends the max runtime within the software update, so just to show you what I'm referring to, is if we right click an update, Config Manager has this tab called Max Runtime. So in the event that an update takes more than 60 minutes, what basically happens is it stops monitoring it and it considers it as failed and it can hold up other processes. So that's why we do have some time limits for how long a pop-up can be applied, specifically in the update scenario. So next up, we wanna determine how we wanna actually handle if the user has it open. So you can choose, you know, I wanna notify the user and allow them to snooze it indefinitely. So any amount of times they can say, I don't wanna apply now, let me snooze. Now that might not be okay because the update might never get applied. So what we're gonna use for this example is we're gonna say the user can snooze it three times. If it gets to the third time, we're gonna automatically apply it and they can't snooze again. So they'll get, they'll get a pop-up for 45 minutes or 60 minutes where it would get applied. You also have some options to choose how you wanna handle the pop-up if they're in uh, do not disturb mode or focus assist, meaning they're in like a PowerPoint and they're presenting in like a full screen mode. Um, by default, we just will discard it in the background and it won't count against them. Yeah. Okay. Now, the other thing that can be quite helpful is by default, we're going to notify and add the processes that we know are applicable to that product. So for Notepad, it's notepad++.exe. But let's say that you had some type of extension, say Zoom meetings, and let's say that it had some third-party add-ins that could also be using those processes. So maybe Outlook is an extension. Maybe there's an internal how, uh, app that's specific to your company. You can actually add additional processes that will be used in the check as well. Um, but by default, it should handle the core executables that are specific to Notepad in this example. But just know that you can add more if you have use cases where you want to check for other processes as well. And then another cool feature is we do allow custom branding. So when this pop-up appears to the user that says, hey, you need to close Notepad because there's an update that's needed, you can actually brand this to be specific to your company. So this helps to build trust that you know things are coming from your IT. Hopefully this will reduce things like potential support cases that get opened up because maybe people think it's malware or some type of pop-up. So if you have kind of specific branding that you often use for any type of user interaction, you have the ability to customize the banner image as well as the text. So for example, let's say that I wanna add custom text as well. So by default, actually, let me just preview the default text first. So if we preview this, uh, here's the message that the end user would see if they had that app open and an update was being applied. So it would just say something like, in order to apply this update, you know, we need to close files and it would list the app name. And then depending on your options, they could either close and update now, or if you enabled snooze, 
they would also get the snooze feature. Now, if you wanted to really customize this message, you can actually go through and you can apply different languages and customize the message for each of those. So let's say that you also uh, had end users that used French as a language. So we could go ahead and apply that and we could customize the wording for everything in that pop-up, both for English as well as for French or any other language. So for English, I'm just gonna pre-populate it with the default options for both the install. We can also have the pop-up apply if it's trying to uninstall and the files in use. And we can even change the message if it's an update. So you can really customize what you wanna say here for each different scenario. Now let's say that for French, we can use the default. And for certain languages, we'll pre-populate the default message as well. So both for update, install, and uninstall, we could apply that. And based on the language pack that is currently in use on the client side, it will pop up to match that language specifically. So we'll go ahead and do okay on this, and then uh, we'll come back in. So if you did wanna have a custom banner image where it was unique to your company, you could go in and set various different image types. So let's just say you wanted to use a different image here. So you could go through and apply an image with your branding, your logo, uh, to really set how we wanna use it. For this one, we'll just use the default here and click OK, and then OK on here, and then apply. Alrighty, so that's gonna be the manage conflicting processes, and we enable that for Notepad. So what we'll see on the client side once we jump to the client side actions, we'll actually see what that looks like when it's being applied um, on the client device. So just to kick things off, what I'm gonna do on the back end is I'm gonna run a synchronization, which will just get that update publishing. Um, so what we'll do now is that that's really most of the actions that would be applicable to the software updates, right click features. We're gonna jump over to the config manager apps feature. So let's come back through. And let's go here. And so some of these we won't touch on if we've already covered them for the apps, or sorry, for the updates. But Jordan, would you want to cover the managed security scopes? Sure. So one of the things that you can that you can do that we've added in here is the ability to tag security scopes specifically to an application. So inside of configuration manager uh, and Intune as well, actually, you can create different types of security scope to restrict what applications should or shouldn't be available within the console to specific groupings of, of administrators in the environment. Using this, you would then be able to say that because this particular administrator, maybe their server admins in the case that we're building out here, um, they're allowed to see these specific apps. Uh, and so they should be able to see them, have access to them and do whatever they would like to do with them. And then maybe we have some desktop admins here and we could then tag those scopes and attach those scopes to those specific applications. And in this case, only the server admins or only the desktop admins would be able to see those specific applications once they were published into the console. So for here, if we did FileZilla server, we could say, well, since that's for server, maybe we only want server admins to be able to see that app and deploy it. And for the client, we could actually set it so that the desktop admins tag would only be applied to it. And then only people who had the desktop admin scope attached would be able to actually see and manage it, plus the default users in the entirety of the environment. All right, thanks, Jordan. So what we'll do, we'll jump over to 7-Zip, and this will actually be an application that we enable and we actually run through Config Manager and through that console, and we'll actually publish this one. Uh, manage com uh, command line. Uh, Cody, would you want to talk about the manage command line? And yeah. I know this was also one that came up in the pre-screening questions about it would be awesome to be able to modify command line. So this is actually one that mm -hmm. you know some people may not have known about. Yeah, so with modify command line, the way this works, we, we do provide a default set of parameters. Uh, generally speaking, the parameters we provide are strictly for silent installs and suppressing reboots. Uh, so if you want to append additional arguments, you can come in here and provide those additional arguments. Uh, there is also a special variable at the bottom, which can be useful, percent current dir percent. A common use case there is if an application requires a parameter, maybe like an INI file, 
you could do you know slash config equals percent current or percent slash config dot ini or something similar. Uh, I know an ask is out there to override our default command lines. It's not currently something we support, but it has come up somewhat frequently. Um, but yeah, I mean, this gets used a lot. I think it's probably one of our more commonly used right click options, honestly. Awesome, thank you. All right, while we're in Note or 7-Zip, let's talk about the ability to move applications to a custom folder. So if we go ahead and look at our command line, or I'm sorry, our uh, console for Config Manager, and we look at the applications, we can see we have a couple things going on here. So we have a folder called Patch My PC, and then we even have a subfolder of that called 7-Zip. Now, for the purpose of right-click features, what I'm going to do is actually show a global option that kind of ties into the right-click options. Uh, if we click on the options of the Config Manager apps, we have this feature where we can globally choose to move any application that we create to a custom folder in the applications node of your Config Man console. So that's something that can be applied globally where all applications we create by Patch My PC would go to that custom folder. Now, in the event that you wanted to get more specific at the app level or the product level, it might make sense to have the move application feature uh, within the right-click feature to be applied. So let's say that for 7-Zip, we wanted to apply this to even a more specific folder for organization purposes. Um, where you can apply it there as well. Now, I'm not sure, I wanna say that Config Manager, did they apply security scopes to the folder level? I wanna say that was, yeah, they did. So maybe you even wanna use security scopes and features where you move them to a specific folder and it could also tie into security as well. Um, so that's where this right-click feature can get uh, pretty helpful as well, just for organization or even security level within the console. Okay, while we're there, uh, Adam, would you want to talk about the manage application and user experience? Yeah, so this ties in with the um, deployment type settings on an app in the user experience tab. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, that's pretty much like a, a reworked interface of those things so that you can set all of the other options that you would otherwise do manually in that tab in a config man app, but apply those in the publisher so that they apply consistently um, for each new version made. So maybe you want to adjust the runtime. I can't remember the other options. Quickly jump back in there, Justin. So you got the yeah. runtime, um, the visibility, pretty much anything that you're maybe already familiar with today when configuring this tab, the user experience tab and a deployment type of a config man app. Yeah. Let's see if that app happened to get created yet. So yeah, so we can see I just ran a sync just to try to get this showing up where we could actually kind of relate to what this means in relation to the uh, to the actual deployment type. Uh, let's see. This might be the properties of the app. Let's see. There we go. So let's come back over here. That's not it. It is the deployment type, right? That's, did I just miss that? Yeah, I know so. no, it's user experience on the deployment type. There we go. Cool. So this is where it can relate, like Adam was saying. So rather than having to go and apply things after, if you wanted to change any of these settings like max run times, you can do that all directly from here. And you could even apply that globally, you know, where you can right click and apply it a broader scope as well. All right, so this feature, add the executable names in the deployment types install behavior. What this feature uh, corresponds to is there's a option within the install behavior where config manager kind of has a feature where it can kind of exit out if something is in use. Um, similar to the way that we do the manage conflicting process, but it's a lot less feature rich and it basically just will not allow it to apply or be closed without any interaction. So it's kind of similar, but we do give you the ability where you can set this and we'll automatically populate the executable name 
uh, as well as the, uh, the friendly name of that specific product for you, where you don't have to do that manually. Okay, uh, so set custom application icon and properties. Uh, Andrew, would you wanna talk about this one? Sure. Um, I'm responsible for most of the icons and properties, so you guys should never need to change them. Um, but if you don't like what we have chosen, you are free to update them to something custom. So if you want to change the description to maybe something localized for your language, you can do that here. Um, you can also change the icon if you were um, if you want to use a different icon. Um, you can also change what the application name looks like within um, Software Center for the localized application name. Um, and within the console, actually, um, for the application name. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Alrighty. The view, do you want to cover the transform here? Sure. So if you have a transformation file that you would like to apply to the MSI um, installer, um, if you already have a built one, you can always um, just select it there. You only need to do it once. Um, and that's it. Patch My PC will continuously use that MST file with each new version of that application. Um, two things to keep in mind here. This option, of course, won't be available to EXEs um, because we cannot apply MSTs to EMS e EXEs. And then the second one to think, the second thing to keep in mind is if the vendor for some reason changes some property tables um, or adds something new that doesn't exist in your MST file, then of course the installation will likely fail. So keep in mind that um, we recommend to check the MST from time to time against newer releases as well. One thing I like to mention with this option, uh, if you specify an MST file here or a CAB file, uh, you do not need to go add it as an additional file. Uh, we sometimes see customers add an MST file here and then they go edit their command line add the parameter for MST and then they go add an additional file. So you end up with two references to the same thing and it can kind of cause some issues. So if you use MST, use this option. You don't have to do anything else. Just edit it here. Yeah, good call out. Alrighty, so let's go back to the right clicks. And what we'll do, let's jump over to Google Chrome. And we're going to enable Google Chrome 64 bit as an app. And what we're looking at here is the feature to manage and or uh, sorry, command lines. No, we want the scripts. There we go. So this one we'll look at for Google Chrome is the manage installation scripts or uninstallation scripts. So this is actually where the right click features, the initial option that we offered was actually the ability to execute a script pre or post update or application install. So for Google Chrome, we're, we're currently in the apps tab. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna say if Chrome was ever deployed as an application, we wanna set a custom post script and we're gonna have it set the Google Chrome homepage. So what we have is we have a PowerShell script and it's basically just setting a couple of registry values that set the Google Chrome homepage uh, values that are specific to the startup page, the actual page it starts up on, and new tab. Uh, and what it's gonna do, it's just set it to patchmypc.com. So we're gonna have that run post application install so that any time uh, Chrome is installed for the first time, we could also apply this for update. So if Chrome was updated, it could also verify the home page is standard. Uh, it would apply. So uh, Cody, I know that you know quite a bit about additional files and folders. Do you want to mention some items here? Yeah, for sure. So uh, this is another really popular one, uh, and we're actually building out some additional features that I'll mention too. But with this option, you know, you've got prescripts, you've got postscripts, additional files, additional folders. The way this actually works, when you specify something in here, um, regardless of where it ends up coming from, we add it to the content of the package. So we commonly have a, a Google Chrome homepage script that we add. Um, we, we just store it on the server or some share, doesn't really matter where. Uh, when you add that as an additional file and then we package up that application or that update, that content gets copied into the package and then 
the client downloads the content and that's where it actually gets put in. So your clients don't need access to demo one sources, scripts, example.ini. It ends up as part of the content for the actual product. Uh, and we support this on both install and uninstall. Maybe you need to do some additional cleanup or something during an uninstall. That's an option. We've got more flexibility otherwise with some of our checkboxes. Now I know a common request has been, I want to pass arguments to my scripts, vendor, product, version, something like that. Uh, we will have in our next preview, there will be variables that you can append to your pre and post scripts for vendor, product, version, a um, couple of other things. I forget specifically, uh, app ID, package ID, I think. So we've seen customers say they do their own, um, you know, like branding inside of the registry, maybe for custom inventory or something like that. You're going to have that option in a coming build if you want to pass arguments. I did also make a new link or a new announcement in the chat that I linked out to this article. But this is actually a real uh, case that we had for a customer where they wanted to use the additional file where they had a script that would copy a plugin for Notepad++ uh, into the source folder post installation. So basically there was a zip file that contained the plugin and there was simply a script that would extract that, that zip uh, into the plugins directory of Notepad++. So this is a real kind of example of maybe there's some extensions or really any type of customization that require additional files or customizations uh, and a real use case of where this could be quite helpful. Uh, before we jump to another one, let me just go back into our sync schedule and let me just publish this so we can get these apps publishing in the background. Go. Alrighty. Uh, featured app, so there's not a whole lot here. Um, basically what the setting as a featured app will do is within the properties of the application and config manager, it will check this box that would simply show it at the top of the list within company portal or software center whenever uh, that application is published. So it would be the first in the list if you make your deployments available to users where they would see that featured application first. Okay. So exclude from auto publishing. Uh, ben, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so I love the auto publishing feature. So we can look at the inventory coming back from your devices. And if we see a number of devices with a specific piece of software installed and we support it, we can automatically enable that application for publishing, which is really cool. Now, if there are some applications that we support in the catalog that you explicitly do not want to enable we can use the right click option to exclude it from auto publishing um, that will visibly put a cross through the application and we will not enable the application if we find it and you have auto publishing enabled and we can apply that at both the vendor level and the individual app level as well awesome yeah thanks ben all righty uh Cody, do you want to cover the republish? I know this is a feature that you've done some work on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and this actually relates to some of the questions we had in the spreadsheet, and I think I've seen it come up in the chat a little bit. Uh, so we now have the option to republish across all four tabs, you know, updates, config man, and then the two Intune tabs. So how republish works is a little different across each tab. Uh, the main use case for a republish is if content changes so uh, for config man it has a little bit less use right with config man because we can read and write to that content source on the fly you almost never need to republish we just always keep that content up to date and we'll just update content you know on the dps so that's not a big deal you might use republish for config man if we reach out to you and say hey you know you're experiencing a bug with script runner republish we'll copy paste in the latest script runner but aside from that uh, it's going to get more use on your updates tabs and your Intune tabs. So if a if a change a right click option changes, maybe you add a pre post script, maybe you added a transform file, um, something like that, you would need to republish, or maybe you change the logo or something. Uh, now I will say we are working to improve this. We've got uh, some dev work going on to prompt you to republish if you make a change 
that warrants republishing because I know it's not immediately obvious like you know to us we say well content change republish we understand that's not necessarily obvious on the customer side so we are working on improving that but that's the use cases it boils down to content changes yeah thank you for that uh, let me just also do chrome as an update really quick and get that syncing in the background okay so back to the config man apps i think that's most of the right clicks that are okay so actually let's do this is actually a really good one so there's this option for managing application update and retention so if we look at the global options for the applications we have this option where we can say how do we want to update an application when a new version comes out so for example let's say a application was created for google chrome let's just say version 89 uh, what do you want to happen with that application that was created when version 90 comes out so for example if i go look at my console let's just do a quick refresh here we can see that we have google chrome 105 that got created when i ran that synchronization so how would you want to handle when Google Chrome 106 comes out, for example? So these are the global options that would be applicable for every application that you've enabled. So the default behavior is we would say we want to update Google Chrome in place. So that means that that exact version of Chrome, that, that exact application, if I go ahead and show the unique ID, we would say that we've detected we already had version 105 created by patch my PC and the default behavior is we're going to actually just update this existing unique ID and replace it with everything for Google Chrome 106. So we would come in and we would go to the deployment type. We would update the content. So we would download the latest MSI. We would change the metadata versions and we would update the content and refresh that on the distribution points. We would also update the detection method to check for version 106 and newer uh, for that as well. Um, so one thing to call out though is the retention options also apply for this, whether you're updating in place or whether you're creating a new application for each new version. Um, either option, you can choose to retain a certain number. So a, a helpful use case is, let's say that we did choose the update in place you could also choose to duplicate and retain three older versions as well so even though that even though the default application will continue to be updated and always be at the latest so that if you're using task sequence or deployments you're always deploying the latest version we would save and duplicate any previous versions up to three versions where it would be saved as another application that's different so in the event that let's say you went from Google Chrome 105 to 106 to 107 to 108, and let's say version 108 broke something, you could potentially revert back to the three previous versions if you had the retention option turned on. So that's how it can be applied at the global level. And let's say that you did not, uh, uh, yeah, let's just keep three retention and updating in place. But let's say that you had Java, and let's say Java was a little bit more scary for you. You know, you weren't sure if you were to update in place whether that could break existing installations and you wanted to have a lot more control over that. You can overwrite that global option at the individual product level. So you could say for Java, I don't want to update in place because I'm not sure if those applications might be required, deployed as required or if I'm installing new machines and those task sequences were deploying the latest Java version, if that might break some internal application that you know, was maybe developed that could not be compatible. So let's say for Java 8, you wanted to create a new application each time. So then you would have an app for each version that comes out and you would have to do more manual interaction to control when you actually want to deploy that application. So that's where the right click that overwrites that can actually be pretty helpful as well. Um, uh, so there is also some requirements that we can set for config man app. So within the deployment type of any app, there's this requirements feature. So there are some that we natively can set for you. So let's say that for, let's go back to FileZilla. 
let's say for the server, you also only wanted to apply that for a server operating system. So you could simply go through and right click and that would set the requirement script for you for server or workstation, or you could also do only apply for 32 bit. So in the event that you know you only wanted an app to be applicable and applied for a 32 bit. Now this will only work on 32 bit apps. You could say I only want that to be applied on a 32 bit. So if you didn't want to have the 32 bit version of an app install in a 64 bit architecture, you could set that requirement and they would not show applicable if you wanted to say ensure that only the 64 bit version or product goes to a 64 bit OS. That's where that can be pretty helpful. Alrighty, so let's jump over to our Intune apps. So for Intune apps, we'll go ahead and right click at the products level. Uh, Wes, would you want to talk about the assignment feature for Intune? Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. All right. So this is the one of the funner parts, you know, we're everybody's venturing over into the cloud. So we have to kind of relate relate everything over into a different terminology so to speak i always consider i always call these deployments but they're really assignments when we go over to intune now required available uninstall all kind of the same principle what we had before but if we wanted to push something out directly to a group of machines we would set it as a required if we wanted to make it available in the company portal we can do that as available so we're going to go in here we're going to make some assignments for this application to be available in company portal. We can pick all users, but what if we want to do rings? We could do that as well. We can go ahead and set up those rings. We could pick the three top groups there. We could even go so far as create another assignment. Let's take this a little bit closer to the config manager side of things. Go back into the add assignment there for me, Justin. And then pick HR and let's pick sales. I'll do what I normally go through. We'll pick those guys. And from in here, we can take it a little bit further. We can scroll down. If we set those rings, we can go and say, we don't want to mess with the HR team. Of course, we don't want to. We want to exclude them from any of the assignment. And then we want to go ahead and say, well, sales team, they have a mixed bag of machines. Well, we're gonna take something else, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of here a little bit, but we can filter. We're using the assignment filters within Intune. So we can turn on and we could exclude things that are found in a filter. And when you pick the filter that you've selected, you go in there and hit where it says, uh, say hit exclude for there. You can pick whichever type of machine that you don't wanna include in that. So you could find the Dell machines. And then you could you could have some limiting type collections like we're used to seeing in the config manager world, bringing it over into Intune and using that filter option to kind of have that same feel that you have over there. So you could still push it out to a very large group, but then limit who you're going to send it to. So very helpful. We can also limit when it gets pushed out or when it's available by clicking on the name there, picking the how many days out. Now this is a little different when we when we step over to the manage. Uh, the Intune uh, from our cloud icon, but we can show how many days out from when that application is available uh, and has been published in there. So really helpful tools in there as well. So a number of things that we can click through there uh, and really get it to where we can fine tune how we want to do this in your environment. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks Wes. For the purpose of the demo, we'll just make it available for all users though and just so that we can see some applications get applied via Intune. So let me just go ahead and right click on 7-Zip and we'll turn on a couple of those features that we already had looked at for some of the other right clicks as well. Um, so let's just do logging, let's do disabling. Yeah, let's just do logging for this one. That should be good. And what I'm gonna do before we look at some other ones, I'm just gonna run a synchronization just so that we could see the Intune app get created once we're ready to jump over to the client side. Um, so let's go back to all products and uh, Jake, would you be interested in covering the enrollment status page feature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have, we give you the ability to manage your enrollment status pages. If you're unfamiliar with what an enrollment status page is, it's a place where you can configure what exactly happens during the autopilot process. And in that particular section, 
there is an option where you can configure what are called blocking applications, which allow you to force certain applications to install before a user ever actually gets to their desktop. Um, super useful for things like Office, security tools, different things like that. But we do give you the ability to uh, have full access to change all of those. That's going to be under Devices, Justin, um, and then Windows, and then Windows Enrollment. There we go. Probably right, pull up the default one or any of them, honestly. Yeah, let's look at company wide. And then if we pop into properties and we scroll down a little bit, we might have to actually edit our settings here. Yep, because we don't currently have it configured. But if we edit our settings and scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's an option where you can block device use until required apps are installed. We'll, we'll select that to select it by default, um, and we can select whatever apps we have listed. So we can update this list for you. Now, previously, uh, as far as ESP is concerned, the apps kind of came down in a random order regardless of what you set there, but recently that has changed. So now if you actually have your applications set there, those are the first ones that'll ever attempt to do the installation during your autopilot scenario, and then all your other applications will come down after the user is at the desktop. Awesome, thank you, Jake. So what we did is since we applied that on the all products level, I went ahead and enabled Notepad++. So once that gets sent to Intune, it should also apply to our enrollment status page. So once we jump over here in a little bit, we might be able to dig into that a little more if we have enough time. Alrighty, so for categories, let's say that we wanted to go back to that 7-zip application that we created. We do also have the ability, like Config Manager, where you can configure categories within Intune. So within Company Portal, uh, users have the ability to go through and kind of filter and select available apps through categories as well. So let's say that we wanted to give the 7-zip, the file archiver category. We could do that. Let's say for Notepad++, which we enabled. Uh, maybe we want to come in here and let's add that under the development and design. So we could add that there as well. Um, let's go back. Alrighty, scope tags. Is this one that you would want to cover, Jordan? I know you did security uh, scopes in Config Man. We could come back on security for Intune. Oh, hey, it's the same thing, but a different platform. <laughs> uh, so this basically gives you the exact same functionality that we were talking about before in Config Man, except for where you were restricting who could do this and who could do what on the Config Manager side of things. Now you're restricting who can do this and who can do that on the Intune side of things. Um, so basically you can create scope tags and you can create tags behind the scenes as to who can interact with the applications and who should be allowed to see them. Um, and then you can tag them to the tags as well. And you can actually give them different components or if you had custom ones as well for custom roles for being able to deploy them. Maybe you've got a specific team that's allowed to deploy them to specific chunks of machines or things like that. You could actually set that up behind the scenes. Awesome, thank you, Jordan. Alrighty, override Win32 application options. Uh, Cody, is this one that you'd want to cover? Because I actually have no idea what this one does. <laughs> yeah, sure, go ahead. Go ahead and click it. I don't know what it does either. <laughs> um, no, so uh, we we have some options that appear in the Intune global options. We, we do something very similar for Configuration Manager too. We have some global options around how products are handled as they get updated. Uh, and so we take all of these options here, and we made them overridable at the per product or the per vendor level. So if we go ahead and open up this UI here, uh, we are able to change all of those settings per product. So you might have a specific use case where maybe you want to specifically retain more of some line of business app that's important to you, or maybe you don't want to retain anything for some specific product for some reason, or just in general, change any of those options around updating assignments, copying assignments, um, or, or anything. It's worth noting that um, the options change based on Intune apps or Intune updates. So for example, on Intune updates, the enrollment status page options do not change. Uh, they're not available because we don't support ESPs for Intune updates. So that form just is useful for overriding all of those. Some other ones that do kind of correspond to things that we have already looked at, so things like excluding or republishing, uh, we won't worry about covering any of those. 
Uh, the only one that I think we haven't covered is the pause updates. Um, let me come back over here. Let's see, um, Adam, is this one that you would want to take a look at? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think you've also done managed dynamic assignments yet. I've, oh, yeah, uh, or, good call. Or good have call. you? Yeah. We have done. Um, yep. Pause updates is a relatively new feature part of the Enterprise Plus subscription where you can um, only at the product level effectively say, I do not want to see a new update for this product until a given date. Um, I think the max that you can set right now is like six months, but you know that's helpful if you've just had a bad experience with an update from a vendor and you're sick and tired of them. You don't want to see another version again for a month. This is a nice, easy way to kind of in an automated way, make sure you don't see another one. Um, and then after a month has passed, you'll just be uh, from that month receiving new versions after that one month or any period of time. Awesome, thank you, Adam. Alrighty, so that was the Intune app. So we enabled some of those right clicks. We enabled some of those products. Uh, what I'm gonna do is let's just go ahead and apply these settings and let me just get a sync running in the background so some of that can take effect. Go. And we're going to jump to Intune updates for just a second. And what we're going to do is we're going to go, actually, let's go to Notepad++. For the Intune version of this update, we're just going to quickly right click, and I'm just going to turn on the option for notifying the user, just like we did before. And I'm going to choose OK and apply. Now, one feature that we have that is relatively new we have the ability for updates where you can simply create the required assignments using the right click and manage assignments. So this is a pretty common option where uh, people will go in and they'll create their assignments that are required. And then those updates for Intune, they'll evaluate using requirement rules whether or not there's an old version and whether or not they need to be applied. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and click on three different groups. So we're going to have a staging group. This is going to target devices and have a deadline for one day. We're going to have a broader group that is a three day deadline, and then we're going to have all our production devices. So we are ringing, kind of ringing these out like we could in Config Manager using collections. And what I'm going to do is set my deadline for one day after any version of that product gets uh, an update created for it. So that would be a deadline for my pilot for one day from availability for a new update. For my broader pilot. As a side note here, um, I personally like to avoid deadlines whenever possible, only because they work a little bit differently and in tune. The app will never attempt to install until after the deadline has actually happened. However, it will show up in Company Portal the second it's made available, and it'll just show up as downloading, and there's no way to force that installation or anything like that. So if you want to avoid some, you know, maybe potential user tickets or anything like that, generally recommend avoiding using deadline if at all possible. Sorry to jump in there, Justin. No, yeah, that's a great call out. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and enable some of the defaults here. But what we're going to do is we're going to right click. So that's kind of the standard way that any product that we enable would get deployed. Now, one of the newer features that are, is part of Enterprise Plus that uh, Adam mentioned is dynamic assignments. So the way that dynamic assignments work for Intune updates is they're, they're pretty similar to automatic deployment rules within Configuration Manager if you're familiar with ADRs. So we can simply click on Add. And what we're going to do, we're going to name this critical security update. And there's filters that we can apply that says if an update, regardless of whether it's selected, has a CVE, we want to make sure that we publish that. And what we're going to do here is for the assignment is we're going to say if it's a critical update, we're going to want to apply this for all our users. So I'm just going to go ahead and select all users. Actually, let me do all devices. OK, all devices here. It's kind of funny. It's a little bit laggy here for my RTP connection. Let's go here. And we're going to keep the deadline as soon as possible because this is a critical security update. And we want to make sure that that gets applied right away. So let me click OK on that. 
there we go. Let me quick manage. Yep. So that assignment is all set. Now we also have this feature. Let me click OK and come back in here and click preview. Let's see if our preview shows up here. So we can see that for the products that we've currently enabled, Notepad for the updates, we can see this one did actually meet the criteria because there was a CVE within the metadata of the update. So if we run a synchronization and there's updates that have security fixes, so actually let me go, let me go turn on Google Chrome as well, because Google Chrome typically will have CVEs. So we're going to go over to Google Chrome, turn that on, and then let's go back to my assignments at the global level for dynamic. Oh, let me apply these settings first. And if we go back to manage dynamic and preview this now, we can see that Chrome is also going to meet the criteria. So these would get deployed right away if they met the criteria of that dynamic assignment rule. There's a couple other options, like we can base it on severity level. So we could say critical severity, which is typically the same as having a CVE, uh, or we could have different classifications or titles that we could use in these assignment filters. And let me go ahead and choose to sync my device so we can get that running. So that's most of the core right clicks. I think we covered just about them all from the server side. Let's actually jump over to a client device and show you how this looks. So if I go ahead and go over to my device, this is a config manager managed client. So we can see we've got this uh, showing up here. Now, when we actually published the updates, we did have a deadline for one day from the deployment. So for Notepad++, we can see that it's available and we allowed it to show in company portal, but the actual deadline isn't until tomorrow. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna manually kick off Notepad. And what we'll see is we have Notepad++ running in the background. So if you recall, we did enable that right click option that said, if there's a conflicting process open, I wanna show this pop up to the user. So within the CCM logs folder, we have our patch my PC script runner dot log. Um, and like I mentioned the PowerPoint, it's kind of funny, this was initially just named based on the fact that executing scripts pre and post was just the first thing that we had to do. So this log file will exist for config manager directly in the client logs. And this will essentially show you if you've enabled any right click options for a product that is specific to a uh, client side action when the installer update is happening, it will create this log for you. So this is actually quite helpful. We can see things like the command lines that's gonna be executed. Uh, we can also see if there's been a notification, we can see it getting launched. We can also see the timeout based on the max runtime of the update. Uh, we'll see that in the log. We'll also see whether or not the user clicks snooze or whether they click close and update. For the purpose of this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna choose close and update. So this will have our pop-up notification on the end user, close the conflicting application, and then it's gonna automatically launch the update. So we can see, for example, it's running the update. It took about, let's see, there we go. It took about four seconds to apply the Notepad++ update. We can also see that it deleted the public desktop icon using that right click feature. And then lastly, it uh, you know exited with exit code zero. So if we come back into add remove programs, we can see we were at version 7.9.1. If I refresh, we are now at 8.4.5, um, including that pop-up. Now for Google Chrome, let's take a look over here. So we currently have Google Chrome open. So let me go ahead and close it, open it again. And we can see just the standard Google homepage for this device is google.com. We can also see that we have our desktop icon and it's actually located on the public desktop. So if we recall for Google Chrome, I believe we did disable the self update feature. We also choose the post script that sets the homepage and we also chose to delete shortcuts. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this update before the deadline. We will take a look at the script runner log. We can see that we're now ex executing the MSI. 
And we can see it automatically added the logging for Google Chrome's MSI. For the default log folder that we chose in the right click option, it's in a subfolder called Patch My PC Install Logs. And then this is actually the verbose installation log for Google Chrome's MSI. So this, this feature can be quite helpful if an update or an app is failing that you actually can look at the vendor's log to understand why it's failing. So typically what Config Manager will report back or Intune if it fails is often a generic 1603 Exacode that just means fatal error. This isn't really something that's, that's super helpful, especially if we're trying to support and help you detect why it failed. And this is where having logging enabled, even globally, actually globally, I would say is typically what we would recommend um, because if it's if a product supports a log, it makes sense to have that and it will automatically purge after 28 days from this folder, but it will just ensure if an update or an app fails, we at least have some data to help you or for you to help yourself to go and analyze why the vendor's installer actually didn't work. Um, so what we can see after the update was applied with Xcode zero, it then went through, it detected there was a public icon it deleted that. For Google Chrome, where we disabled self-updates, it actually set three different registry values within the Chrome policy key. So it automatically turned off updates for you. You didn't have to go research or do anything there. Then lastly, we executed that Google Chrome homepage PowerShell script. One thing I don't think I mentioned is the file types that you can execute pre or post script. We can do PowerShell VB script batch file and we can even execute an EXE or a MSI using the pre or post action as well. Um, so we can see that ran and the script and the MSI both exited successfully with Xcode zero. So if I go back to my desktop, we can see the Chrome icon is now deleted. And if I go launch Google Chrome, I can see the home page was automatically set using that post action PowerShell script within the um, within that right click option. If I also go over and go to help and click about Google Chrome, we can even see that the updates were disabled globally using that registry value via the post action or via the right click option as well. Um, so just an example for Chrome where you can actually see from the end user side that the updates were turned off from an admin level and it couldn't be edited by your users. So that's the two different features that we did uh, for the updates. We now have our base apps. So if I go ahead and click on 7-Zip, we can just take a look and we can see that 7-Zip is not currently installed here. So if I go ahead and click install, I'm actually gonna be able to look at that same Patch My PC script runner uh, log file that was being used to execute the updates, that's also going to show us any of the stuff happening for our application installations as well. So here in a second, we should hopefully see 7-Zip kick in where it's going to start to install and we'll actually see the execution of the MSI happening here as well. So for example, we can see that base installation, we can see it running the MSI, all the command lines, and we can also see since we had the right click option for logging, we now have the installation log for the MSI as well. Um, so this will work both for updates as well as for the initial installation using the applications. So that looks good. And I think that's a good part of the client side. So let me actually see if we have our Intune client and whether or not that is actually up and running. Sometimes the Intune client can take a little longer for policy to kick in. Let's see if we've got that yet. All right, so we do have some stuff showing up here. So we can see we have some apps for Notepad and 7-Zip showing up. Let's just take a quick look and see if we launch this. So. So this is actually, I think, the base application. I'm not sure if the updates have kicked in because if the updates are applied, we'll be able to see those um, actually start to apply in the back end automatically. Um, so we'll, we'll let that kick in a few, a few minutes because that can take some time for policy to kick in. But I believe for the most part, that should cover 
pretty much all the right click options that we were looking to cover today. Um, so let me just jump back to the PowerPoint. And there's the live demo. And uh, yeah, I think that that's actually going to cover everything we had. Now, for the for the engineers that were monitoring our Q and A, uh, do we feel like there's maybe any questions applicable that might be helpful to share that maybe came up a lot that we could call out? Uh, one that's kind of come up, and I don't. We may have mentioned it very early on. Yes, this is recorded. Yes, it will be on our YouTube. Uh, so it's going to be on you know, youtube.com. I think it's forward slash patch my PC. Uh, so this will be there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. That actually came up quite a bit in some of the emails as well. Um, so that yeah, it's will also be worth it. So it's also worth calling out our ideas page because a few questions um, are already posted on our ideas page at ideas.patchmypc.com if you're looking for new features. Yeah, that's a great. Great call out, Ben. Um, so yeah, if you weren't aware, uh, one way that we build out new features within our product is heavily based on our customer feedback. So our user voice, where we actually get feedback from customers, is ideas.patchmypc.com. Um, so you can browse here. You can see things that are trending. So one example, you know, we have a lot of popular ones that we actually saw get brought up through the pre-screening questions. Uh, one that I know came up a little bit was allowing multiple different types of configurations per application. So for example, uh, maybe you wanted to have, say, Google Chrome, and you wanted to create different deployment types or different versions of that app that had different settings. That's actually one of the more popular user voices that we have from Ideas today. Um, so if you weren't aware from Ideas, we do have a lot of feedback here, and this would be a place that you definitely want to monitor. From here, you can also go out to our roadmap. So that will show you recent features that we've actually implemented based on all that feedback that we're getting from customers, as well as any new products that we've added uh, as well to our catalog. So definitely a great, great resource to make sure that you're providing that feedback and able to see you know, the feedback that we're implementing on through our roadmap. I did see this come up a couple times. Will the questions and answers be saved anywhere public to look back at? We are investigating the best way to do that. So uh, an optimistic yes. Awesome. Good question. Um, I think we showed it, but it's good to note these are all documented pretty well. Uh, it, it's a right click option at the very top actually for you know more info about these. Uh, but we do have a whole page that is dedicated. It is continually growing, uh, but it, it details these all pretty well, or at least um, it's not detailed, it's high level and it will link off to a detailed doc. Cool, well, I think that we're at a good point now to wrap up. So just wanna say thank you for attending. This was actually the largest webinar by far that we've ever had. So we had over 1500 customers uh, register for this webinar. So just wanna thank you all. Uh, we had a lot of great feedback through the registration questions and we hope this was valuable for you we do hope to do more webinars as well just showing various aspects of the product we realized that you know some of the screening questions where people didn't even know right click options were a thing um, that we could do much better at, at making maybe a monthly webinar or, or webinars for various topics of the product to make sure that uh, our customers are getting full use of the features that are even out there today, not even including ones that we're hoping to work on soon. So once again, thank you for attending and we hope you enjoyed the webinar.